ideology teaching program which the government of kerala has organized in connection with the uh, in uh, with the support of the children's heart link in this class today when i am introducing you to the clinical examination of the child with heart disease the idea is this i know that you know to examine a child with heart disease but to how to customize it to produce the maximum benefit for you and the patient and um, answering some of the clinical questions and its correlation with the on the ground problem of managing the patient this is what i have tried all through my lectures and um, you are welcome to ask questions at the end while examining the child with heart disease i would always say don't think that this is meant only for the for the academic exam hall it is as much intended for the emergency room therefore it's very important for you to realize this patient who is in front of me this infant newborn who is in front of me will he give me the time for a detailed evaluation at my leisure or do i need to take a decision within a few seconds this is a problem that all of us encounter when we meet the baby for the first time so answer this question yourself is the child comfortable or in distress if the child is comfortable go on to measure the an usual anthropometric parameters height weight head circumference why this is relevant to cardiology i'll explain as we go along then of course heart specific questions like is there cyanosis or clubbing as a pediatrician you would definitely do a head to toe examination for congenital abnormalities you would note an abnormal facies any limb anomaly like polydactyly syndactyly etc these things would have a relationship with the diagnosis that is going to emerge at the end of the examination identifying the child in distress is important from a cardiac standpoint a child who is tachypneic and you know the the rate of respiration which would be considered as tachypnea would depend on the age of the baby if it is a newborn it's more than 60 if it is a infant it is more than 40 the number keeps coming down as the child is aging a baby with head bobbing is in serious trouble a baby with intercostal and subcostal retractions need a lot of attention if the baby has poor pulses tachycardia the faster the rate the faster should be your response in these circumstances the guidelines that should govern your approach are not from this classroom but from your pals guidelines or your neonatal advance uh, life support guidelines if you are seeing a critically ill child the overarching importance of the pals and nals guidelines for managing the child cannot be overemphasized in those instances clinical examination would be fast and decision making prompt with regard to icu admission and possible ventilation we presume that this is not the state when we are discussing the rest of the class you have concluded that this child is giving you examination time now many of the things that we said is in relation to the respiratory system so how do you approach a child in dyspnea from the context of cardiac assessment dyspnea unpleasant awareness of one's own heartbeat in the case of a baby is more like it needs to be objective because the baby can't tell you that he is unpleasantly aware so we will go more by the respiratory rate and the unpleasantness will be measured by things like intercostal retraction and subcostal retraction it is important to understand why we attach so much of importance to these signs dyspnea and its equivalents mean either the left ventricle has failed and elevated its end diastolic pressure or there is a mitral valve obstruction and there is a raised left atrial mean pressure in either situation the left atrial mean pressure has gone up mitral stenosis a supramitral membrane cotriatriatum obstructed tapvc all these cause a pulmonary venous hypertension so left ventricular failure or raised la mean pressure the physiology consequence is pulmonary venous hypertension what's wrong with it at the capillary end if the pressure is going up 
you know the factors that govern the flux of fluids across a capillary bed. So if the hydrostatic pressure has gone up at the capillary end, at the venular end of the capillary, what would happen is that there is a transudation of fluid from the intravascular compartment into the interstitium and if the pressure is high enough into the alveoli. So we are speaking of an interstitial edema or even alveolar edema. Once there is fluid in the interstitium, you have your J receptors in the interstitium and that would stimulate respiratory center, increasing the respiratory rate. And when the baby is increasing the inspiratory effort and the lung doesn't expand proportionately. Normally, when you and me take a deep breath, our lungs expand. When the poor baby with pulmonary venous hypertension is attempting to take a deep breath or exercising pressure to take that deep breath, the lungs do not expand proportionately. As a result, what the baby is doing is to generate an intrathoracic negativity. What can go in will go in intercostal muscles, subcostal muscles, they go in and we call it retraction. If the obstruction was not there, they will not go in and the lung would expand and fill these spaces. So intercostal and subcostal retraction is an objective evidence of the effort of breathing that the baby requires to move the water locked lungs. And this would happen Classically in a large VSD where the left ventricle is overloaded, the left ventricular end diastolic pressure goes up, LA pressure and the pulmonary venous pressure goes up. Or in an obstructed TAPVC, there's nothing wrong with the LA and LV except that they are small, but the, pulmonary, the common pulmonary vein is obstructed and the pressure inside that is going up, resulting in edema, alveolar edema. Co-triatriatum is like mitral stenosis. There's something above the mitral valve preventing free flow from the upper part of the left atrium to the lower part and pulmonary venous hypertension results. So this is how one or other mechanism of pulmonary venous hypertension happens and it results in dyspnea or its equivalent. If you're speaking of a hypoxic baby, you're at the other end of the spectrum of physiology. It's not pulmonary venous hypertension, but what you have is hypoxia. How does hypoxia causes um, a dyspnea? You know, the stimuli for respiratory center are a drop in PO2, a drop in pH, or a rise in PCO2. And in a cyanotic child, exercise causes tachycardia and an increase in the venous return, and therefore an increase in right to left shunt. The systemic vasodilatation in conditions like tetralogy allows the right ventricle to pump easily into an overriding iota. The result is desaturation, stimulation of the respiratory center, and dyspnea. You're examining the child. One of the key cardiac events findings that you're looking for in a small baby is to see is the baby cyanotic or not. Cyanosis clinically you would cause, you, sorry, you would define as a bluish discoloration of the skin and mucous membranes due to an increase in the level of deoxyhemoglobin. It should be more than five grams in the capillary blood or more than three grams in an arterial sample if cyanosis is to occur. But today, cyanosis, you don't debate whether this child is cyanosed or not. You measure the SpO2. And an SPO2 less than 94%, you consider as low and you start looking critically for it. Cyanosis, we classify as central and peripheral. Central, when it is due to a cardiac or lung cause with a right to left shunt. Peripheral is because there is an increased oxygen extraction at the capillary level. And uh, this happens when the, there is intense vasoconstriction and therefore it would disappear if you warm the extremities, you are likely to see it oh, over fingertips, maybe even on the tip of the nose or the earlobe. And once you feel that the baby is cyanosed, look at the distribution of cyanosis. Is it uniform or differential? And in actual instrumental addition to your examination, when you're measuring SpO2, measure it in the right fingers 
and also in any of the toes. This will tell you whether there is a differential cyanosis. Clinically, if it is there, great. But don't rely on clinical examination to look for differential cyanosis, particularly in the neonate. Do check the SpO2 in the right upper limb and one of the toes as mandated by the pulse oximetry guidelines. Clubbing is seen in the older infant or child. If a baby is cyanotic from birth, the clubbing is likely to appear by six to seven months. And um, as the child grows older, clubbing becomes more manifest if there is established cyanosis. So if you're seeing a cyanotic baby, you need to customize it to look at the features that can create cyanosis. So the first question we already said, uh, you can't debate about cyanosis. You're going to check SpO2 and um, you're going to see the difference between the upper limb and the lower limb. And you're going to answer the question, uh, is the cyanosis central or peripheral? Then the question comes, especially in the newborn, is the cyanosis cardiac? A baby, look, think of a baby with transposition of great arteries on day one. The baby looks comfortable, but the baby is cyanosed. We would call it peaceful cyanosis as against a baby in distress with cyanosis. The axiom should be that the baby with peaceful cyanosis has a cardiac cause and the baby with a respiratory distress and cyanosis has a lung cause for it. There are overlaps on this. A uh, obstructed TAPVC has a combination of cardiac and respiratory factors causing cyanosis. But this is a very useful guideline in an young baby. And you can always check the response to oxygen. The hyperoxia test has not become outdated. If you give 100% oxygen through a head box for 10 minutes, if you have a very good PO2, say more than 300, you can think that that much of improvement in the PO2 can occur only with a lung cause. It can't happen if there is a right left under the heart. So if the PO2 remains less than 150, it could be cardiac cyanosis. Rather than these absolute values, which your examiners might ask you, use this data with your judgment. The higher your PO2, the less likely it is cardiac. The lower your PO2, the more likely it is cardiac. And if you were to check the ABG in a baby with a cardiac cyanosis, the characteristic things will be a low pH, a low PO2, in other words, there is acidosis and hypoxemia, and a low PCO2. If the lungs are normal, if the baby is tachypneic, the baby can wash out the carbon dioxide, and as a result, the PCO2 will be low. This referred to differential cyanosis. This expression means that cyanosis is more in the lower limbs than in the upper limbs. Specifically, in screening a newborn, you mean that there is a more than 3% SpO2 difference between the right upper limb and one of the feet. In the older child, it may be evident clinically and it may be supported by clubbing. If you are seeing a newborn, with a 3% SpO2 difference between the upper and lower limbs, it has two implications. It could be still a normal heart, but persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn. Remember in PPHNS, the PA pressures are systemic and um, the pulmonary arterial blood is shunted into the descending aorta through the duct. So the lower limb saturation is bound to be low. Even worse, if you have a duct dependent systemic circulation, think of an interrupted aortic arch, there is no flow between the left common carotid and the left subclavian, or there is no flow distal to the left subclavian. And the body is sustaining life by pulmonary artery shunting blood through a duct into the descending aorta. You have to have lower saturations in the lower limb. And that is what we mean by a duct dependent systemic circulation. You have other examples for it. In the older child, Eisenminger PDA is the classic example of differential cyanosis. PDA, large PDA has gone uncorrected for a long time. And you find that at the age of 15 or 20, you see a child with um, differential cyanosis and clubbing. I hope you can see this image. Please look at this carefully. There's a story behind this. This is a image of a child in Iraq when I was working in Chennai. A, a doctor sent me a data 
to ask whether this child is operable and whether they can transfer the child to India for treatment. I had the feeling that we are dealing with Tyson Menger. So we got in touch with the father of the child rather than the doctor and asked them to take a picture like this and send. Okay, if you can see those pictures, please look at the hands. There is clubbing. You can see the cyanosis. And you can see that the, the toes are obviously clubbed. And you can see the right hand and you can see the feet. The right hand, fingers, and the, and the toes in both the feet are obviously clubbed and cyanosed, whereas the left hand appears better. This is typical of Eisenmenger PDA. So I advise them not to uh, transfer the child from Iraq to India for treatment. This is using very limited resources for management of patients. So this child we need to manage medically. The child has already missed the bus for surgical treatment. So this is differential cyanosis and its clinical utility in decision making. We can make the issue a little more complicated. Think of a reversed differential cyanosis. Because in differential cyanosis, we said that it is the lower limbs which have a lower saturation. Can you have a situation where the lower limbs have a higher saturation and the upper limbs have a lower saturation? If this is to happen, the ductus should carry better oxygenated blood into the feet, into the descending aorta. And when can ductus carry better oxygenated blood? In other words, when does PA saturation becomes more than aortic? You call this condition transposition. In a TGA, if there is a coarctation, the pulmonary arterial blood, mind you, it is coming from the LV. It is a good saturation. It is that blood which will perfuse the lower limbs. And therefore, in a TGA with coarctation and a PDA, of course, it is the lower limbs which have a better saturation. You call this condition a reversed differential cyanosis. And it is not very uncommon if you're dealing with neonates with critical congenital heart disease. And um, association of coarctation or interruption with TGA or its variant toxic being anomaly is very common. In toxic being anomaly, more than 30% have associated coarctation. So this as an SPO2 difference will be noticed in the NICU by the diligent nurse or registrar. A different evaluation is required for a baby in cyanotic spell. Remember a cyanotic spell, there is a rapid decrease in the systemic oxygen saturation with hyperventilation. If you don't intervene, the baby goes into convulsions, coma and death. The key components of a cyanotic spell is one, tachypnea. The respiratory rate is fast. Repeat, the respiratory rate is fast. And before you arise, saturation is dropping from, say, 70 to 10 or 20. And so you need to act very fast. Please note that any baby who is cyanosed, the cyanosis will worsen on crying. That is not cyanotic spell. It is just cyanosis on crying. Cyanosis worsened by crying. But crying can trigger a spell when there is a rapid drop in the saturation to smaller digits. And that is the spell. The difference between the two, the cyanotic spell is an emergency and you need to act instantly. A child who is crying and is becoming blue, if the child is comforted, the child is going to be all right. Comforting will not be the solution to a child who is in spell. Why does this happen? Typically a feature of tetralogy, there is a drop in the systemic vascular resistance due to some factor or the infundibulum goes into spasm. You have an overriding aorta. So the RV finds it easier to pump into the aorta with a lower resistance than a pulmonary artery, which is obstructed. So as the right left shunt increases, there is acidosis and the acidosis triggers the respiratory center into hyperventilation. There's no point in hyperventilating because it's not increasing the pulmonary blood flow. And so this goes into a vicious cycle. Now, these are all emergencies that you should be prepared for while beginning to start examination of a cardiac child. But quite often, fortunately, you have a quiet baby. In that baby, 
you start with your anthropometry. You need the height, weight, and head circumference. You need to answer the questions like, is there mild cyanosis or clubbing? And you are going to do your head to toe examination and look for abnormal facies, limb anomalies, and all. And um, where did I start with um, height, weight? It's your basic pediatric examination. But remember, failure to thrive is a problem in congenital heart disease. It can happen in congestive heart failure when there is a feeding difficulty or decreased caloric intake, there is an increased catabolism, recurrent respiratory infection, systemic venous congestion causing anorexia and poor absorption. It may be a part of the syndrome of which the heart is a part, and recurrent infection may be due to low immunity as in a Dijot syndrome. So failure to thrive may become a part of the presenting symptoms of congenital heart disease. Just taking you through some of the common syndromes, I will not explain what are the features of Dijor syndrome to you. I expect you to know better, but I will just highlight that don't expect a classical Dijor syndrome and look at these single features, like a little abnormality of the nasal tip, a little nasality of the voice as the only marker of 22Q11 deletion. It, today, that what you are looking for is in a fish test 22Q11 deletion, and this could be associated with a variety of common problems called conotrunkal anomalies as a group. It includes conditions like tetralogy, truncus, interrupted aortic arch, TGA, and VST. So when you are seeing some of these common conditions, noticing a subtle abnormality which your trained pediatric uh, eye would pick up, that may underline the need to test for uh, 22Q11 deletion by fish. Similarly, Williams syndrome with the elfin face. I hope you know what elves are. Elves are appeared in Midsummer Night's Dream of Shakespeare. They are uh, quixotic creatures, short, uh, funny faced creatures. So an elf like face is the elfin face with a prominent forehead, hypertelorism, an upturned nose and a small mandible. This is characteristic of Williams syndrome. It does not appear in the neonate. It, seem, it takes a few years for the typical phase to appear. And seeing that phase mandates that you look for the common abnormalities that go with Williams syndrome, like supravalvar aortic stenosis and pulmonary stenosis. Similarly, Nunans and Down. In Nunan, the associated cardiac lesions is a pulmonary stenosis. The, unlike the conventional PS, the valve is dysplastic. There may be a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as another association, or the ECG may show a left axis deviation. And in Down syndrome, you know that complete AV canal defect is the characteristic defect, even a partial AV canal could occur. But remember, many Downs may have simple lesions like a VSD, ASD, or it may have a tetralogy. That tetralogy may have AV canal as the VSD. If you have waded through all these problems, now you are seeing the child the way you would examine the heart. You need to look at the pulse. You need to look at the blood pressure. You need to look at the JVP. So what we said so far is take the decision that do I have the time to see this kid in detail? Yes, I have the time. Therefore, I have looked at the anthropometry. I have looked at the general examination. I have my impression as to whether there is cyanosis clubbing at all. Now. I'm looking at the heart and the cardiovascular system more critically, and I start that with the pulse. Now, we may reread Hutchison in this to say that pulse is a pressure distension wave. It is due to ejection of blood into an already filled iota, propagated along the arterial walls, and palpable in all superficial peripheral arteries. And the pulse wave has components called the percussion wave, which is related to the LV ejection, the tidal wave, which is due to reflectance from the upper part of the body, and the dichrotic wave, which is the recoil of blood from the closed aortic valve and reflectance from the lower part of the body. Look at this. In this, this is the percussion wave with the systolic peak. You have the dichrotic nodes, and then you have the dichrotic wave. And um, at this point, 
the second sound has occurred and what is happening after that is diastole. And when you are describing the pulse in an older child, in an infant, making the, such details would be difficult. Certainly describe the rate, pulse is say 120 per minute. And um, depending on the rate, you are going to say, conclude whether it is normal or tachycardia or bradycardia, depending on the age of the baby. So is it regular or irregular? What is the volume of the pulse? What is the character of the pulse? Is there a radiofemoral delay? And what are the peripheral pulses like? So in the abnormalities of rhythm, we speak of a regular irregularity. Every third beat is an ectopic. You'll say that it's a trigemini. Alternate beat is an ectopic. You will say that it is a bigemini. It could be irregularly irregular as an atrial fibrillation. Practically, atrial fibrillation does not occur in children. The frequent ectopics and a multifocal atrial tachycardia due to lung disease is more likely cause for an irregular fast rate in a child. Atrial fibrillation is an adult problem. The volume of the pulse, the volume is the amplitude of the expansile movement of the vessel wall. If you're feeling the pulse with your three fingers, it is a middle finger which will feel the volume and assess the amplitude of the expansile movement of the vessel wall. It could be normal, it could be low, or it could be high. When you're checking the blood pressure, it is a pulse pressure which will measure the volume of the pulse. And you get a low volume pulse in low output state or severe aortic stenosis, severe pulmonary hypertension, or a high volume state in aortic regurgitation, PDA, AV fistula, fever, and in adults, of course, in pregnancy. Abnormalities can occur related to the volume of the pulse. We speak of a pulse's alternance when you see that alternating pulse beats have a lower volume. Today, you're more likely to see it in a pediatric ICU if you're monitoring an arterial trace in the post-op child if there is a low output. Uh, it is a feature of denote, uh, feature denoting severe left ventricular failure. What happens is that the lower volume pulse represents a, a contraction of not the whole of the myocardium, whereas the higher volume pulse, the is representing contraction of the entire myocardium. It's often triggered by an ectopic beat. The post-ectopic beat, uh, it elicits a better contraction, you have a higher volume pulse. The next beat, there is no such stimulus, it's a lower volume, and this keeps repeating for a while. On the other hand, the other abnormality of pulses paradoxes would be seen in a pericardial effusion. Constrictive pericarditis is less common in the pediatric age in Kerala. In North India, you may find that also. An exaggerated inspiratory decline of the pulse. In the older child, it is elicited by a sphygmo manometry. The, as you are recording the blood pressure, listening to the sounds, when you are deflating your blood pressure cuff, you find that the sounds are erratic, intermittently heard initially. This is because the sounds are heard only in expiration. Later, they are so heard continuously, and that is because you are hearing it both inspiration and expiration. So this could be due to cardiac tamponade, constrictive pericarditis. It can also occur in status asthmaticus. Today, as I said, you are more likely to see these things by recording the, your arterial line uh, pressure and uh, looking at the arterial line waveform in the ICU. We also speak of the character of the pulse. A collapsing pulse with rapid upstroke, ill-sustained peak, rapid downstroke. It is appreciated with distal palm elevating the arm. What we mean is, if you want to feel the collapsing pulse in an aortic regurgitation, hold the child's hand like this, and um, this part, the, the distal part of the palm, should be feeling the pulse elevate the arm and you suddenly feel that the volume has increased. That is how a collapsing pulse is elicited. Uh, any hyperkinetic state like fever, pregnancy, anemia, aortic regurgitation, PDA, ruptured sinus of salva is generally an adult tissue, an AV fistula, AV fistula might have been created for dialysis, truncus arteriosus, a BT shunt, aortopulmonary collaterals. These are all reasons for runoff.
You could also have a bisphariance pulse, which is typically seen in chronic severe AR. It's a, it means the percussion wave and the tidal wave are palpable. Normally, the tidal wave is not palpable. So when both are palpable, you get a bisphariance pulse. It can occur in chronic severe AR or uh, AS plus AR or Hockham. This illustrates the characters of some of the pulses. If you see here, this is the normal pulse. Look at the percussion wave. It's the dichrotic wave. You're not seeing the tidal wave. And uh, in pulses alternance, the feature is the same. But please note that this is of a lower volume than this. So the systolic pressure read here will be less than the systolic pressure read here. And pulses bisphariance, tidal wave has become prominent. And then you have the dichrotic wave. So in every pulse, you feel the two beats. Classically seen in chronic severe AR or AS plus AR. And pulses paradoxes is a more slow process. In inspiration, the traces show that the pressures are low. And in expiration, the pressures are high. Dichrotic pulse is not something that people speak about often, but and it was attributed to, uh, it was commonly seen in typhoid fever in the past. This is because the dichrotic wave is palpable due to a vascular paralysis. The normal tone of the arteries, it prevents you from palpating the dichrotic wave. But when the vessels are paralyzed due to the toxins generated during toxic fevers, today you will more likely see it in a dengue fever than in typhoid fever. In aortic stenosis, you speak of the low volume, slow rising pulse. If you like Latin, it is pulses parvus et tardis. Or an anachrotic pulse when there is a shoulder on the ascending limb. This again is better seen in an ascending aortic trace uh, in the cath lab rather than felt by the hand. Once you have um, estimated your pulse, what is the rate, what is the volume, what is the character? Now you're going to look at the peripheral pulses. You definitely need to feel the pedal pulses. Uh, I would always say that don't necessarily go for the femoral. You see if the, both the pedal pulses are well felt, you have no reason to go for the femoral. The femoral is a little more invasive palpation and many infants may not allow you to do it. So if you check the pedal pulses first, I feel that would be better. So you should definitely feel both radials and both pedals and see whether there is any asymmetry of these pulses. There are a number of reasons by which you can get asymmetry of the pulses. Coarctation, aberrant origin of subclavian, takeyasu, where some pulse is gone. Uh, there is a condition called isolation of the left or right subclavian. I'll come to it in a second. In supravalvar aortic stenosis, a feature of Williams syndrome, the ejection from the heart which passes through the stenotic area above the aortic valve, the jet hugs the arterial wall and it is distributed into the right side. So your right radial pulse and the blood pressure there is higher than the left radial pulse. So in a dysmorphic baby, if you find that your right radial has a higher volume than the left radial, this is actually known as the coanda effect, borrowing the term from physics, it's a feature of supravalvar aortic stenosis. But in a coarctation, coarctation you identify by your pedal pulses and your femoral pulses are feeble. In that context, if your right radial is feeble, it denotes an aberrant subclavian, which is originating distal to the coart. If your left radial is feeble, it means your coarctation is prior to the left subclavian. In tetralogy, rarely you may find that a pulse is weak. If you see that, the first thing to look for is whether the child had a BT shunt on that side, in which case that subclavian could be compromised. If this is a child which who has not been operated, tetralogy may be associated with a ductal origin of the ipsilateral subclavian. You say that there is an isolation of the subclavian and then that pulse is feeble. Radiofemoral delay is elicited by a simultaneous palpation of the radial and femoral pulses. Femorals could be absent, feeble, or delayed, and it usually denotes coarctation of aorta. The aortoarthritis and other causes of arterial occlusion could also be considered in context. You have a 15-year-old child who was all normal till then. There's a history of a systemic disease, and you find that there are the femoral pulses, one of them is weak, 
it's likely that a, a patient has IOTO arthritis. Blood pressure, you have different ways of recording the BP in the children. An older child, you could have a sphygma manometry with an appropriate pediatric cuff. You could use a flush method to check the mean BP in neonates. And you could check the oscillometric technique, which is what all of us do in what we would call as NIBP. It's an oscillometric technique. If you're actually listening with the uh, sphygma manometry, you have the Koretko sounds with a phase one denoting the first loud sound, phase two, the soft murmur, three, loud murmur, four, muffling of sounds, and five, disappearance. And hypertension is blood pressure more than the 95th centile for age. Pulse, blood pressure, and JVP. JVP is measured in the right internal jugular vein in older children and adults. Underline in older children and in adults. Do not try to look for it in an infant who practically has no neck available to you for examination. In an infant, the systemic venous hypertension would be best reflected as a hepatomegaly and if it is even more advanced by facial puffiness, but not by JVP. But in the older child, it's useful to look at the JVP. It reflects the right atrial pressure and um, it has different wave patterns like the A representing the atrial contraction, the V representing the ventricular contraction, the X descent of tricuspid valve in, with RV systole, and the Y descent RAMT uh, with tricuspid valve opening and an inconspicuous H wave due to passive filling of the RA. Now this uh, image, which will be available to you in your textbooks, you can see that the A wave, see what happens to the A wave. The A wave is taller than the V wave normally. This is the right atrial contraction. And then you have the, the C wave. As you are seeing it, it may be a transmitted pressure from the carotid. You have the X descent, which is the tricuspid descent. You have the V wave, which is the passive filling of the RA, and then the next A wave happens. If you have an A wave which is prominent, how do you know it is A wave? Keep your hand on the opposite carotid when you are looking at the JVP. If your hand is on the opposite carotid, it should occur just before the carotid. It is a pre-systolic wave. So there, you should you could have severe pH or severe PS are the common causes of a prominent A wave. Either there is a severe pulmonary hypertension, as in primary pulmonary hypertension in an adolescent child, or a severe valve RPS, the A waves are prominent. You have a different ball game when you see cannon waves. Cannon waves are systolic A waves. Remember, regular A waves are pre-systolic. These are waves that leap to your attention like a cannonball, they are systolic A waves due to atrial contraction against a closed AV valve. So in other words, the atrial contractions are not appropriately synchronized with the uh, ventricular contraction. They should not occur together. When would this happen? In complete heart block or in a junctional or ventricular tachycardia. You will get regular cannon waves in a junctional tachycardia irregular cannon waves in complete heart block or in ectopics. If you have a prominent V wave, it means that there is a pulsatile flow into the RA. This happens when the RV is pumping into the RA with tricuspid regurgitation. So you get a prominent V wave. And how do you know it is a, a V wave? You have your finger, your hand on the opposite carotid and you feel the, uh, the carotid pulse as you are visualizing the V wave. So that is the prominent V wave. In an ASD with mitral regurgitation or the LV to RA shunt in a Gerbode defect, these are things which cause the V wave to become prominent. You could have a Kussmaul sign in constrictive pericarditis when there is an inspiratory rise in the JVP. From this, you are progressing to precordial examination. Remember, general examination, pulse, blood pressure, JVP, now the pre Cordial. You would note the shape of the test. It is relevant to us because it can influence the position of the apex bead and the apparent heart size. A pectus excavator, where you find a, a depression of the sternum, it pancakes the heart between the sternum and the spine and causes apparent cardiomegaly. 
the pectus carinatum or the pigeon chest, think of the pigeon in your mind, the chest is bulging forward. That is usually a sign of cardiomegaly at an young age. Before the cartilages are fused, if the heart is pushing the, the chest wall forward, the, ba the child ends up having a carinatum. Kyphosis and scoliosis could be congenital abnormalities or it could be part of a vertebral disease or by part of a lung disease, which has caused a, a, a push or pull over a period of time. You could also be having a surgical scar. Now, all over the state, you'll be finding operated children. A midline star is due to a median sternotomy. You could have a thoracotomy either on the left posterolateral, anterolateral, right. For different purposes, you will find thoracotomy scars. Other pulsations, you could um, see a left parasternal pulsation. A prominent left parasternal pulsations would be seen in atrial septal defect or in other conditions of RV volume load. And in an ASD, actually the entire heart would have a common pulsation because the RV pulsations extend to the apex at the, the apex, apex is formed by the RV. And pulsations in the left second space denotes enlarged pulmonary artery. And epigastric pulsations denote RV enlargement. Pulsations of all of the precordium in late systole can be due to LA pulsations in mitral regurgitation. A left parasternal heave occurs in RV pressure overload as in pulmonary arterial hypertension. You can have pulsations across the sternum in Epstein's anomaly. Pulsations to the right of the sternum when the, if the ascending aorta is pulsating in Marfan. The one thing that is missed there is the apex beat. Uh, the slide on that is missing. The apex beat is the overmost and outermost point of definite cardiac pulsation. When you are feeling the apex beat, the lowermost and outermost point of definite cardiac pulsations, and the location of the apex beat tells you where the heart is. Is there a cardiomegaly? In a child, you normally expect the apex beat to be in the fourth space in the midclavicular line. In an older child, in the fifth space inside the midclavicular, it's always inside the midclavicular line. If it is a forceful apex beat, the, the normal apex beat, you just feel the pulsation and it goes away from your hand. But if that apex beat is sustained for more than a third of your, palp your systole, you call it a forceful apex beat. And if it's more than half, you call it a heaving apex beat. A forceful apex beat denotes an LV volume overload. A heaving apex beat denotes a uh, condition like aortic stenosis or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy where there is an obstruction to left ventricular ejection. To palpate the first sound over the apex beat, you call it a tapping apex beat, and that's a feature of mitral stenosis. So the pulsations, you feel the apex beat and then look for the other pulsations that we have said. Now, auscultation, the heart sound as well as um, the murmurs, we would um, deal with separately. The, you know, with regard to the first sound, the second sound, any additional sound, any murmur, the mechanisms of dealing with the first sound. The next class has been titled as murmurs, but I'll call it heart sounds and murmurs and deal with, uh, together. This is um, again, uh, perhaps this is best uh, taken along with the next class when we are discussing heart sounds and murmurs to give you time to ask questions. Thank you very much. I would be happy to answer questions, whichever way you like to ask them. You can either ask them directly or if you can chat, whichever way is okay for you, I'll be happy to answer questions.
I don't find any questions. Please go ahead. Sir, good morning, sir. <laughs> good morning, Sri. I'm Dr. Ajit from Calicut. Okay, Ajit. Uh, it was Please a nice, go ahead. It was a nice talk. Uh, I'll, I'll ask. Uh, uh -huh. No. I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. So At least still you, now. So, for the sake of the audience, can you just uh, explain that uh, pulses uh, paradox? I mean, uh, pulses paradoxes and. Uh, oh, okay, sure. Slightly uh, article uh, in detail, slightly. So that yeah, there is sure. one area where uh, usually the undergraduates uh, have that problem, pulses paradoxes. How to elicit? using the sure. I'm just coming to it. Thank you. That was a nice talk. Let me get that slide. Ah, sir, again. Sir. Hello. 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 Yes. Uh, sir, I am Dr. Bennett Silas speaking from uh, Trivandrum. Yeah. Uh, sir, my doubt is regarding the pulses paradox itself. See, in asthma, in severe cases also, you get a pulses paradox. How will we explain about this? What is the reason for behind it in asthma cases? Good. Uh, good thing that the two questions are linked. That makes it technically easier for me to answer you. See, the just do that. Normally, there is some retention of blood within the lung. In inspiration, as the lungs expand, normally okay. there is retention of blood within the lung. Okay. If the lung volume is increased, there is a greater amount of blood that is, shall I use the word, sequestered or kept away in the lung. To the left heart. In asthma, this is what is happening. In asthma, with a larger lung volume, the ejection from the right ventricle is held up marginally longer in the lungs before it comes into the left heart and that is the reason why it occurs in pulses uh, why pulses paradoxes occurs in asthma and assessment of pulses paradoxes and judging its importance is in context the uh, the child in uh, in um, uh, tamponade and the child in asthma have nothing in common clinically so this is a useful clinical sign to say that the asthma is severe now about the question of Ajit to Assess pulses paradoxes. Let us say that you are clinically assessing it. You have a, let's say, 10 year old child who has come to you with a viral pericarditis and a pericardial effusion. This child is presenting to the emergency. You are feeling the pulse. The first thing that might strike you is that sometimes the pulse is of lower volume. You have your hand on the pulse. Sometimes the finger tells you that this pulse is of lower volume, but a little later, that looks all right. This raises the doubt as to whether there is a pulses paradoxes. To confirm it, you check the blood pressure. Now, what is happening in pulses paradoxes is the systolic pressure in inspiration is lower than the systolic pressure in expiration. Now, why that happens in inspiration uh, or in uh, pericardial effusion, the, during inspiration, the RV expands. The inspiration allows more venous return into the RA and RV. As the RV expands, remember there is effusion around the heart? Intrapericardial pressure increases. The normal intrapericardial pressure is negative. In um, pericardial effusion with tamponade, it has become positive and that is why it is compressing the chambers. So the expanding RV increases the pressure within the intrapericardial space and it also causes the septum to bulge into the LV. So as far as the LV is concerned, on the one hand, it is compressed by a positive pressure from within the pericardium and on the other hand, here is a septum coming into it and reducing the cavity size. All of this happens in inspiration because the mechanics of respiration sucks in blood into the heart. Now, what will the LV do? The LV's ejection has to drop. 
therefore the systolic pressure in in inspiration is lower because the lv ejects a smaller volume in expiration in inspiration now come expiration there is no longer any expansion of the rv the septum goes back in echo you call this a septal bounce uh, the septum goes back into the rv lv has a better space to fill less compression from the outside from the intrapericardial space and the ejection is more that is the mechanism of pulses paradoxes now to elicit it you have to demonstrate that the systolic pressure in expiration is higher than the systolic pressure in inspiration so you use a cuff you are elevating your manometer pressure to above the systolic level and listening when you are listening you initially hear the sounds irregularly if you have a hand on the child's abdomen you recognize that when you are hearing the sounds the child is actually in expiration and when you are not the child is in inspiration this last may be 10 20 25 beats uh, um, millimeters of mercury as the pressure has dropped to that level now you hear continuously and if you hear continuously it means you are hearing in both inspiration and expiration so you can refer to that blood pressure as let's say 90 hyphen 70 by 50 if you get me 90 hyphen 70 20 is the paradox your slash of the blood pressure recording and 50 is your diastolic pressure do you get it ajit is that clear to you hello yes thank you sir you you said that 90 by 70 then hyphen 50 that 70 hyphen no 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 what is it is 90 hyphen 70 that 90 70 difference is the paradox okay okay you have normally written to your blood pressure you would have called it 90 by 50 if it was 90 by 50 but here you have two systolic bp there is a 90 and there is a 70 so both should come on this side of the slash right did you get it okay i got it sir got it thank you okay. any other question uh, sir uh, this is uh, sir is there any one question sir I'm afraid I can't hear you. Yes, please go ahead. Doctor Suresh, can you hear them? Uh, I can hear you. I'll hear you when I hear them. Okay. Sir, I said he. um sincerely i think you are uh, can you just adjust your microphone a little and speak i think dr suresh is not able to hear you gobiya ningala sound correctly clear avunnilla onnu nanayittu samsarikkavo mic inde aduthottu onnu samsarikkavo gobiya sct trivandrum okay okay sir the question is in one with talk and critical ps how to differentiate sciatic spring and duct closure Sit it one minute. I don't think Dr. Suresh can hear you. Can you text it? Can you write it in the chat? Your question. Can you type it in the chat, please? Please do. Uh, she was too soft spoken for me. <laughs> Yeah. 
In the meanwhile, if anyone else has any questions, please feel free to ask. event which is occurring in an older infant in other words you know that this child was doing reasonably well um, yesterday or an hour ago and the child has suddenly presented with an abrupt deterioration in the case of a, a newborn which is having a ductal closure if you are monitoring the saturations the saturations are steadily coming down if you have missed the diagnosis the child has been sent home and is coming back the child comes with profound hypoxia. Then our problem is of managing an acutely hypoxic child and see how the child improves. The, if you're dealing with a newborn, the child who has got severe hypoxia from a ductal closure, think of critical PS, think of tetralogy pulmonary atresia, which is living on a duct and the duct is closed. The child's saturation is very low the child has become very acidotic. This state will happen in a cyanotic spell if it is allowed to persist a little longer and no intervention done. So in a one day old, not unlikely to happen on one day, but let's say in a five day old baby with severe cyanosis, which seems to have happened over a day or over a few hours, the most likely thing is a ductal closure. The word cyanotic spell would be sort of inappropriate in that context also. But the problem is a life-threatening, severe cyanosis which requires management, which you will the, uh, manage with maybe intubating the baby, guaranteeing the airway, starting prostaglandin, giving the baby oxygen, correcting acidosis, these things will come. In a cyanotic spell, which is in an older infant, the baby is actually hyperventilating. Unless you have missed that period and the baby has come absolutely limp to you. The baby who is um, in uh, severe cyanosis on day five also has a faster rate. Again, if you have missed that point, the child has gone into severe acidosis and is go presenting with an acidotic uh, type of breathing. So the, my specific points to highlight in my reply, the two refer to two different age groups. One to a baby who is a few days older, ductal closure causing profound hypoxia, and um, cyanotic spell, an older child, older infant, which is presenting with a provoking factor and a rapid deterioration of saturation, which occurs in front of you. The fastness, the speed of deterioration is more in the older infant with uh, cyanotic spell. There is a lot in common between the two because there is profound hypoxia in either case. I do not know whether I have answered the question in your mind. Have I? Sat, has your question been answered? If you want further detail, I can give you my number and you can call me and I can talk to you or mail it to me. Yes, Dr. Srihiri has given by mail to you. Anyone can? Hello? This is Srihiri, sir. Yes, Srihiri. Thank you, sir. Thank you for a wonderful session. I hope everybody would have enjoyed and uh, had gained something today. I've, I've given uh, Suresh sir's email ID in the chat box. Uh, anyone can, uh, if you have more questions, you can write to him and uh, get the answers. 
you're most welcome. I think we, now we should start our days. Yeah, yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Okay, then good day to everyone. Thank you, Dr. Suresh. Uh, one one request to all the units, uh, please participate in the kids program, share the email ID and uh, mobile number of all the uh, postgraduates and doctors who are interested, so that we can activate the quiz. So I have, uh, all, and also share the attendance from all the units uh, in the Google spreadsheet that we have shared. Thank you. So I think we can wind up the session. Thank you. Thank you all for joining. Gracias.